It's my pleasure to introduce to you as we move right on into our next session. Actually, I enjoy your contributions on that. Uh, so I am delighted to introduce my friend and fellow journalism academic, um, Jason Shepard. Jason is uh, chair of um, the journalism program, communications program, at um, Cal State Fullerton, one of the largest um, communication programs in the country. Uh, he's a graduate of our School of Journalism and Mass Communication, like me, multiple times, um, earning his, uh, his doctorate from us. Jason is an expert in media law and also ethics um, and uh, wrestles with many different issues um, of free expression, has a, a widely applauded book on journalistic privilege in a digital age. So with that, I'm happy to turn over the panel to Jason to take it out. Thank you very much, Katie. So uh, it's always a great honor to come back to, uh, to Madison. As Katie said, uh, I bleed badger red, uh, having uh, earned three degrees from the School of Journalism and Mass Communication and spent 10 years um, as a reporter here for the Capital Times. It's, it's uh, awesome to see my editor, Ron McCray and Phil Hasslinger here. Uh, uh, who I learned uh, journalism from. And uh, I have four uh, very distinguished panelists uh, with me today. I'm going to quickly introduce, um, introduce them and then give a, a two or three minute uh, overview. Uh, and then our, our conversation will flow uh, with a sort of open-ended question and answer session that I'll lead and we'll leave about 15 minutes for uh, audience questions. Um, it's, it's, uh, Margaret's, uh, Margaret did a great job of setting up a lot of the issues that uh, we're gonna be talking about uh, today. So let me first introduce our, our panelists. Uh, Rainy Aronson Rath is the executive uh, producer of Frontline, PBS's flagship investigative journalism series, and is a leading voice on the future of journalism. Under her leadership, Frontline has won every major award in broadcast journalism and dramatically expanded its digital footprint. Prior to Frontline, Aronson Rath worked at ABC News, The Wall Street Journal, and MSNBC. Uh, she uh, also earned her bachelor's degree uh, from the School of Journalism uh, here at UW-Madison and her master's degree from Columbia Journalism School. Uh, Lucas Graves uh, is an assistant professor in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication here at UW-Madison. His research focuses on news organizations and practices in emerging news ecosystems and more broadly, on the challenges di digital networks pose to establish media and political institutions. Uh, his very excellent book, Deciding What's True, The Rise of Political Fact-Checking in American Journalism, came out last year from Columbia University Press and is uh, incredibly uh, on point on many of the issues that we're talking about today. Uh, Jason Stein covers the state capitol for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel and is the author with his colleague Patrick Marley of More Than They Bargained For, Scott Walker, Unions, and the Fight for Wisconsin. His work has been recognized by such groups as the American Society of News Editors, the Society of Business Editors and Writers, and the Association of Capital Reporters and Editors. And uh, last, Ken Vogel is the chief investigative reporter for Politico. He is the author also of an excellent book, Big Money, $2.5 billion, One Suspicious Vehicle and a Pimp on the Trail of the Ultra-Rich Hijacking American Politics which chronicles the characters and motivations behind the explosion of unlimited money in politics after the Supreme Court's 2010 Citizens United decision. He has covered politics and government at all levels, from small town cop shops and school boards to state houses, Congress, and the presidential campaign trail. He grew up in uh, Philadelphia and also graduated uh, from the uh, UW School of Journalism and Mass Communication uh, and lives in Washington, DC. So before I turn to our, our panelists, um, let me just sort of set the stage. Uh, you know, today we're talking about some of the biggest questions, I think, facing journalism and democracy today. We really are living in fascinating times for, for our profession. In 2016, Oxford Dictionaries named post-truth the word of the year, and Politi PolitiFact named fake news 
the lie of the year. Someone uh, in the last hour on Twitter uh, suggested that we put a, a quarter in a bucket every time we use the term fake news today. Um, we, we would be putting a lot of money in the bucket, I think, in the next hour. Um, fake news used to describe falsities and disinformation packaged as real news stories and disseminated widely on the web and social media. Fake news has had major consequences. A few months ago, a man showed up to a Washington DC pizza restaurant and fired a gun because he believed the pizza shop was the home uh, uh, of a child prostitution ring run by Hillary Clinton aides, thanks to fake news disseminated on the web. In one uh, study that I find shocking, BuzzFeed reported that during the last three months of the 2016 presidential campaign, more Facebook users shared, liked, or commented on the top 20 fake news stories than engaged with the 20 most important news stories on real news sites. The irony is not lost when President Trump now has weaponized the term fake news to attack the nation's leading news organizations. He has interrupted reporters at press conferences by heckling them as fake news and has used the term in tweets more than uh, uh, two dozen times to describe news organizations offering unfavorable co coverage. And many of us are, are familiar with his uh, tweet to his 25 million plus uh, Twitter followers labeling fake news journalists of the New York Times, CNN, NBC, ABC, and CBS as the enemy of the American people. To many, Donald Trump's post-truth world poses some existential questions for journalists and democracy. And the next months and years will challenge us to confront questions of truth and trust in critically important ways. What does it mean to live in a post-truth world? What are the causes of the post-truth era? What are the dangers to our democracy when citizens don't discern fact from fiction? And what can citizens and journalists do? The ability of people to live in media bubbles with the ubiquity of social media and the decline of journalistic institutions has helped drive the post-truth era. And citizens are much more likely to view facts through their partisan and emotional lenses, leading them to believe or discount facts based on the perceived reliability of their favored information source. And Trump has masterfully exploited many of these new trends. His political rise was rooted in the birther movement as he championed for five years the conspiracy theory that Barack Obama was a Kenyan-born Muslim. As Trump clinched the Republican Party nomination in May 2016, a public policy polling survey found that 59% of those who viewed Trump favorably believed Obama was not born in the United States, and two-thirds believed Obama was a Muslim. That was last May. One of the core beliefs as journalists is that tr the, the truth uh, that we, we dig for and find will set us free. Most of us view ourselves as fighters for and defenders of truth, which is why this post-truth era is so worrisome. My hope is that from these troubled times will emerge a new respect for the kind of journalism that so many of us value and the kind of journalism that is crucial uh, to engage citizenship in a healthy democracy. So now let's see what these four uh, distinguished panelists think about some of those, those themes. Um, I want to maybe start with, um, with Lucas, and if you could tell us maybe a little about um, your, your work on your book and, and why do people believe fake news and conspiracy theories? The, the easy question, I yeah. guess. <laughs> uh, so that is, that's a really big question, obviously, and it's one that you can approach uh, in different ways depending on whether you know, you're a psychologist or an anthropologist or a behavioral economist. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to think about it. Uh, but the really short story uh, about why we engage in what's called motivated reasoning is that uh, none of us is or ever has been, you know, humans never have been kind of the dispassionate, rational information processors that we like to imagine and that we idealize in civics textbooks. Uh, you know, re reasoning is influenced by an affective component, so there's an affective or emotional element uh, in information processing, which means simply that we have emotional reactions to new information. Uh, studies have shown that, that, you know, those emotional reactions occur even more quickly than conscious thought. 
and they shape how we analyze and how we respond to new information such that very often uh, you know, we try to seek out information that makes us feel good, that rewards us, uh, that confirms our sense of self, you know, our social identity, our political beliefs, and so on. And we run from or uh, you know, try to find ways to diffuse, to reject uh, information that challenges us, information that's threatening. Uh, another way to, to think about that is that our belief systems are really deeply social. So when somebody says uh, that they believe that Barack Obama is a Muslim, for instance, uh, or that they believe that you know, the government had a role in 9-11, uh, what they're doing is establishing membership in a particular you know, social or political tribe. Uh, and actually, in some cases, not every case, but in some cases, it's not really clear how much people actually believe the things that they might tell a pollster they believe or the news stories that they might share on social media. There was a very interesting study done just last year uh, in which a group of researchers found that by the simple expedient of uh, giving people very small cash rewards for right answers, they could dramatically improve uh, people's <coughs> performance when they were quizzed about these really common sort of political lies or political misinformation. So in some cases at least, you know, it may not be that we believe the things that we choose to share. Instead, we're sort of expressing our allegiance uh, to a particular worldview, to a particular political party, a social group, uh, and so on. So for, for Ken and Rainey, uh, what have been some of, at, maybe at the national level first, and then I'll ask Jason about a couple of stories uh, here in Wisconsin, what have been some of the most incredulous fake news stories or conspiracy theory-based stories that, that really have seemed to have taken hold on public opinion that maybe are surprising to you? I mean, I'll, I'll just say that for Frontline, one of the interesting things you brought up was the birther movement, and we really reported on that extensively in The Choice, and we profiled <coughs> President Trump. And what we were doing is trying to show a method of behavior and how that can take hold. And one of the most fascinating things is to actually go back and trace that as a phenomenon. And then it just really did blow up in the election, and you see how social media really ballooned. Many other stories from, of course, the Pizzagate story to the Pope, his support of Trump. But I really love to look at the stories that started to take hold. As you were saying in May, so many people believe this, but it really began years ago, multiple years ago. And that is a phenomenon I think we're studying and thinking about deeply. And, and I love the idea that when people share it doesn't necessarily mean they believe in it. So what I've been counseling people in my office and our news organization is to not share, first of all, before we know exactly what's in the story. So, and that goes for any news organization that we're sharing, but also to go deeper and question what does it mean when somebody shares, what does the community look like, and how do you bridge the divide without just assuming that everybody believes this. I would even go as far to say that a lot of the people in our community say they share, but they don't even want to be part of that tribe. They're just sharing because right now that's an expression that they're feeling. So it's not as didactic as you think. It's not as obvious as, the, as we think at times. Um, yeah, I guess I'm a little bit of an outlier here in that I don't think, I mean, I think uh, this, this I, I think fake news is sort of an overly generalized term that captures a whole lot of things that, that are problematic, but I don't think that it's like an industry of fake news is necessarily affecting public opinion. I mean, the Pope endorsed Donald Trump. No, he didn't. That's wrong. Like that didn't affect the election. You know, there, there there's so many things, so many stories that, that are sort of held up as um, emblematic of this fake news problem that were just like blips that were immediately, you know, struck down. Didn't affect people's thinking. A lot of people shared it, maybe, but it didn't really, you know, as as uh, Rainey suggested, they didn't. And Lucas uh, proved with social science, it's not necessarily because they believed it uh, or that it, you know, they acted on it. Now. There are, there are uh, instances where individuals certainly have acted on things. The Pizzagate conspiracy is, is a great example. Uh, I mean, this is just like batshit crazy. There was an email in WikiLeaks where uh, a guy who had some ties to the Democratic, uh, Democratic Party and John Podesta and John Podesta's brother is talking about holding a fundraiser for Hillary Clinton at his pizza restaurant, Comet Ping Pong, and somehow this conspiracy theory developed where like, Pizza 
was a code word for pedophilia, I guess because they both start with P or something. You know, it's just like crazy, but there's a, a dude, you know, drove up from North Carolina with a gun and uh, went to self-investigate this claim and fired some shots. So that's an instance where the, you know, even if it didn't affect public opinion, it was certainly dangerous and, and problematic. And I would differentiate that and some of the, uh, some of the, some of the, I think, I think there's more potential for danger with some of these theories that don't come from a Macedonian teenager, but rather come from sort of amateur sleuths who have access to all this information. And I'm not one of these uh, journalists who sort of like, you know, looks down on and clucks their tongue at people who are trying to participate in citizen journalism. Uh, but this is sort of the, this is the downside of it that, that, uh, with this information, you can sort of form your own news and form your own uh, conspiracies, and then and then that has the potential, as in the case of Pizzagate or you know Glenn Beck's identification of a totally innocent Saudi guy as as like a suspect in the Boston Marathon bombing. He like used Reddit and social media to like put together this theory, and then he went on the air and like ruined this guy's life. Uh, and and uh, you know the, the the problem is when you have these sort of organic theories that are developed that catch hold either because of like some some uh, like partisan bias or uh, in less than uh, credulous reporting by uh, media outlets that don't subscribe to the sort of uh, you know diligent fact checking that they like to think that legacy media did and that. That does become a problem. You know, that there are instances where that can become a problem, even if it isn't necessarily affecting like the public discourse on a broader level. It, yeah, and I, this is not really in regard to fake news, but uh, first off, I should just thank all of you for having me and uh, a couple of the great mentors I've had, uh, Marty Kaiser, Deb Blum, uh, colleagues like Mark Pitch who covered the Capitol with me. So a shout out to all you guys. Um, it, but just in terms of people often blaming the media when they get an outcome in an election that they don't like, I mean, I guess the example I would give to you, haven't you, have you ever had this happen where one of your friends goes to another friend and says, you know, that person that you're dating, that I want to share with you some things about that person that are pretty negative that I wanted you to know. And then they come back and talk to you about it, and you go, oh, well, what happened? Do you think they're going to stop dating that person? They say, no, I don't think they're going to stop dating them. I think they're going to keep on dating them. Do you ever say, like, well, you know what it must be? You didn't do a very good job reporting on all those bad things about that person. Because I think if you, had, if you had really shared, really dug in to all the dirt of their partner, they, would be, they wouldn't be dating them anymore. I mean, I think it be, because it is that we as human beings we, we are rational, but we are not only rational. And so I think that's something that kind of, you know, that's sort of a street level example of what you're talking about, Lucas, at an academic level. And I think, but I think it is something that sort of is forgotten. I think that, you know, when they say, well, if you had really given them all the information about Barack Obama or about Donald Trump, they wouldn't have reached that conclusion. Well, you know, it's just not that simple. So uh, to, to follow up, Jason, uh, on two uh, Wisconsin-based stories in the last sure. couple of years that, um, you know, broadly under this fake news concept, these are, I think, more stories that uh, when what happens when reporters get a whiff of a story and uh, they have a hard time uh, verifying or do you, do you vet, do you dig, and then do you report if something sure. is true or false? And the yeah. two stories that uh, we had touched base on uh, uh, in the last couple of years, uh, um, the, the supposed love child of the governor right. and Her current uh, governor, correct. And the incident of uh, There's that rumor um, out there. The Congress, it is, uh, Congressman Pocans. It, it is false, at least, well, go ahead. Well, and uh, the story about Congressman Pocans' husband. Sure. So could you tell us a sure. little about those two stories and how, as, as journalists, do you, uh, do you report on stories that are not true, uh, in part, because these things have gotten so much uh, attention online that, that you know, do you ignore them or do you draw more attention to right. them by reporting on them? Right. Well, I mean, there's some easy things, rules that we follow as, as journalism. So one rule is if something comes up like four days before an election, you, you really have to look at it with a really critical eye. And in the June 2012 recall election, one of the fever pitch things that, that came up in the days before that was that our, our current governor 
had a, a child, that he'd had a child um, with someone at Marquette University where they had both gone to school, and that this was a, somehow connected to him leaving Marquette University, which is sort of another whole range of conspiracy theories that, that our newspaper has sort of largely debunked around that. But um, there, was a, there was a woman, she was named, this, all this stuff was out there. And it got to the point where actually um, my colleague Dan Bice, and I, I didn't know this until today actually, I knew that Dan had done a lot of reporting to um, knock that down or just to know that it wasn't true so we could ignore it. Uh, but he actually saw this child's birth certificate, he told me. So he actually he actually had this woman, you know, he, he spoke to the, the purported mother and, you know, she would say, well, no, the governor is not the father of my child. And he's like, well, could I see the birth certificate? I guess I, I don't know how that came up exactly. Well, it's, as we know from Donald Trump, birth certificates are not necessarily the last word and can be falsified. I don't know if it was a long form birth certificate or the short form. <laughs> But, but he saw it, and you know, sure enough, it was not Scott K. Walker that was in the, the father field. Um, so, that's, so that's one. I mean, that's one example in Wisconsin. And then another, another example, that, that, and that one did not really make it into any, any media outlets, I would say. I mean, that was just more something that was out there in the fringes of the internet. And then another example is uh, in 2012, same year, so just a few months after that, um, there was a claim that was made, first showed up in the Daily Caller, that a openly gay Republican volunteer for, for the challenger to Mark Pocan, who holds a congressional seat uh, in this district, second congressional district, that, that he had been um, verbally taunted by the husband of, of Mark Pocan, the congressman, and that he eventually, and, and then within a few days after that, was, was beaten and choked in his apartment and you know, had filed a police report about this. It was a very, very serious claim that was made. And, and the text messages between these two purported text messages were put out there. Um, it, was, it then got picked up by conservative media uh, internet outlets um, within uh, Wisconsin. Um, and we were immediately very skeptical of this claim. Um, you know, I attempted, as, as I was reporting on it, I attempted to do what, what anybody would do, which is to say, like, if these threatening text messages came from uh, the husband of the congressman, um, you know, show, show me that, first of all, how did you two get to know each other? How are you even exchanging text messages? And can we prove that this is the, actually the cell phone of, of this uh, congressman and or of, of his husband and you know the story just fell apart and eventually actually the the person that had filed this police report um, claiming to be beaten and choked eventually recanted and, and the whole story fell apart in, in a very uh, embarrassing way and and for some time it seemed like certain people might be a subject to libel lawsuits over it that never happened but you know so that was that that's one example um, at one of the reporters who uh, reported on that for a conservative media outlet uh, that's funded by the Bradley Foundation out of Milwaukee, now works for um, State Senator Dewey Strobel, uh, one, a, a conservative blogger who, uh, at the time for us, who's now a columnist, uh, did report some of that stuff in, in our paper. Um, so, you know, there, it, that, that sort of filtered out into semi-mainstream um, places and, and, and hung out there for a few days before the, you know, to a certain extent, the police knocked it down. But, you know, that, so that's, I mean, those are, those are great. And once again, that was in the run-up to, you know, elections. So I think if there's one thing that we could say to the public again and again and again, it's probably we should actually repeat this every election. It's just, you know, if it's like a week before the election and something comes out, you should kind of take a look, you kind of, do one of these at it and really see, like, is there, well, what is there here to back this up? Well, on a, on a similar note, let me turn to uh, President Trump and his tenuous relationship to the truth. Um, and and uh, speaking about close, uh, close uh, info being disclosed close to an election, uh, in a recent interview, I think it was in the Time Magazine article last week, uh, President Trump defended his statements 
insinuating uh, during the primary that Ted Cruz's father was involved in President Kennedy's assassination by saying that it was okay to make the allegation because he, quote, had read it in the newspaper, unquote. Um, what have been some of the president's most extreme false statements and how, how should we cover them? We can't ignore, uh, probably, uh, crazy comments by the president, but do we feed into uh, something bad when we are reporting those, uh, those allegations? Um, I mean, I, I kind of agree with Margaret that we have to report what the president says. Now, there is a responsible way to uh, do it and to contextualize and to try to present, uh, you know, try to show if, it's, if, if something is false or there's something that's sort of problematic in, in, uh, in, in, the, in what he said. I don't, I'm also not a big fan of like calling something a lie. I think that's sort of meaningless, much like the term fake news is meaningless. Like show, you know, the journalistic motto is like show, don't tell. If he said something wrong, if it's inaccurate, show why it's inaccurate and what is inaccurate. Um, as to like the most inaccurate things that he said, certainly the birth certificate thing is, is in, in the Donald Trump uh, Hall of Fame of lies. Um, and, uh, you know, more recently you see another example of the way that he uses these sort of outrageous and unfounded statements to his benefit to kind of change the the narrative, so to speak, at, at times when he is most in need of a, a change in narrative, when he's facing sort of a you know rush of negative stories. And I'm talking about his claim that he had his wires tapped, <clears throat> that Obama wiretapped his uh, his uh, campaign headquarters at Trump Tower. Uh, well. You know that was he, he said that at a time when they were you know when this sort of, when, when there was increasing momentum behind some of these storylines related to Russia and related to actual uh, you know ties between his associates and Russia and uh, you know mounting questions about what Russia did you know to to meddle in the election and what their goal was and it had the successful effect of really hijacking these hearings and these in ongoing investigations that were supposed to be about Russia's meddling in the election and uh, the Trump, Trump associates' ties to Russia. Instead, not only we in the media, but the congressional committees that were supposed to be investigating this are, are talking about whether Trump was illegally wiretapped by President Obama. We're still talking about it. this. This uh, Devin Nunes, the chair of the House Intelligence Committee, uh, you know, got some information. We now learn from the White House to to sort of back up this claim. It doesn't really back it up, but it sort of muddies the water a little bit and keeps us talking about this, which is so much better for Donald Trump for us to be talking about this than for us to be talking about what Russia did to hack into the DNC or to steal John Podesta's emails and what their goal was and what the ties were between his former national security advisor, Mike Flynn in Russia or Paul Manafort, his former campaign chairman in Russia. So that's a challenge for us to you know, keep our eye on the ball and to report what he said and to report it out and show in this case, the, as the New York Times did yesterday, the derivation of this story and cast some scrutiny and suspicion on, on uh, you know, the, the way that he's characterized it, while also continuing to focus on the things that maybe he doesn't want us to focus on. So for that very reason, I would, I think, push back a little bit, you know, sort of gently on the idea that uh, journalists can't ever make the decision not to cover something, or at least not to cover something to the extent that the person, you know, announcing it would like it to be covered for strategic reasons. Uh, I mean, it's definitely true that things that presidents say deserve attention from journalists by default. You know, one of one of the journalist's primary jobs is to tell us what uh, presidents and other important officials are doing and saying, and that also applies to presidential candidates. Uh, but it's also vitally important, I think, for journalists to retain the power to independently set the news agenda to some extent and to keep our eyes sort of on the ball and I think that, you know, that comes down to decisions about how much play to give a story uh, that's already been sort of thoroughly covered and debunked. You know, do you put it on the front page, the, you know, the next time that Trump repeats a tweet, retweets a tweet uh, about some, you know, ludicrous thing that, he, that he's been claiming for weeks? Uh, how much space do you give it? 
you know, how much, how, how much attention from reporters should it continue to attract? What can journalists do to give bigger play to the stories that, uh, you know, that aren't getting as much attention, even if, as Margaret Sullivan pointed out uh, in the first panel, uh, even if they are being covered, but you know they're not sort of getting getting attention from other journalists, and they're not getting responses from uh, from the administration. Part of a journalist's job has to be, I think, to kind of try to focus our attention on issues that journalists believe are you know substantively important. I would just gently so I, push back on your gentle pushback and say <laughs> that this is the nicest. Uh, Right. That I mean, in this instance, just you know, because it's in the news right now, this this uh, this claim about the wiretapping, and then the the claim that Devin Nunes had intelligence that corroborated the claim. Well, the the reason why it's in the news is because it has now been debunked by the New York Times. So we have continued to follow the story. But it was to essentially fact check. So by in so doing, you know, it doesn't it doesn't all happen at once. It's a gradual process where you write one story one day and the next story the next day, and sources see, hey, you're on this, and you have a marker down, and you're interested in learning more, and they come to you and you write more, and it's all in the name of it's all in the interest of, of sort of setting the record straight. But in so doing, you are repeating the initial claim, and <clears throat> excuse me, you are also not devoting as much attention or journalistic firepower to some of the stories that were, you know, compelling and in the news that were the reason potentially why Trump threw this out there in the first place to change the subject. Exactly. I, I think counterintuitively, actually, it's a pretty healthy media ecosystem right now. I was just thinking about Frontline's method because we just do long form journalism. And I'm so happy to be in this field right now, especially because we can take the long view. But I am so grateful Politico, Washington Post, and the New York Times are on this and many others as well. But I do think there has been a race to repeat in some media organizations. And then I think what's been really interesting is to see the correction that's happened by so many others in journalism as well. So you can't just talk about one news organization right now or the media. And something that Margaret said that I really resonated with me is this idea that you know we are on it right now. The question is, who is really reading deeply, right? So what are people taking the time to really take the time to read past the headline in the first paragraph? Or in the case of Frontline where we do short form, people are watching that, but are they coming to actually watch the two or three hours that we then do to deliver the goods? And so encouraging time, I really believe in time to do the really important work is huge. And you know, for all of you who are journalists in the room or editors, giving your reporters the time to not have to race, but to think hard and ask, like you were saying, you know, the toughest questions and turning over the rock is crucial to what we're going to get to soon, I think, around transparency and vetting, but also our trustworthiness, right? So we're not just repeating, but we're thinking hard and we're challenging our own assumptions. It's crucial. So I think long form, short form, and daily, and long, really long, deep documentaries are really important right now. I'm not a national reporter, so I'll keep my comments brief, but the one, one thing that Ezra Klein of Vox said that I really resonated for me is, you know, we do, we do really need to stay focused in some ways on the policies that these people in power are doing. And one question I wish would have been asked to Donald Trump more during the election is, you know, can you explain to us your tax plan? You know, and, and really to sort of dig with him a little bit, I wish if someone had asked him, for instance, what would be the top marginal income tax rate under your plan, you know, Mr. Candidate? Could he have answered that question? I would love to know if he could have answered that question, but I never saw it put to him in a way that we got to, to find out one way or the other. Well, and I, uh, Ken made this point that you know some of these more outlandish claims have often come at times when he, he may have wanted to change the subject from more policy-based uh, discussions or questions. Um, well, let, let me just spend a couple of minutes asking about um, how journalists are covering and should be covering um, the Russian allegations and issues. Um, and I think the, there's a great contrast between the work of Politico and the work of Frontline in um, the, the uh, practices uh, of reporting. Certainly, we've seen in the last few months that um, a lot of information to journalists are coming from 
confidential sources in and around the government. And if those relationships were not there, we may not know uh, even what little we do know now. Um, so Ken, can you maybe talk a little about um, the, the, the role of confidential sources and leaks to journalists and how Politico um, deals with those? And, and then Rainey, could you maybe talk a little about um, how, how Frontline does or does not uh, use anonymous or confidential sources? Sure, yeah, I mean, uh, confidential sources are incredibly valuable to what we do, and I'm, I'm certainly not um, not uh, insensitive to the concerns that overusing confidential sources, particularly people, uh, sources who have a bone to pick and are sort of using you to carry an agenda, to further an agenda, is, is a problem, and it's something that we have to weigh. Uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, but particularly in, a, in an environment like this where you have a government that uh, is in some ways working against itself, where it's like Trump versus the intelligence community, no one's going to stick their neck out in the FBI or the CIA and put their name on something about like an, an, you know, an inquiry into, uh, into like a Trump associate's ties to Russian intelligence. So you got, you're, you're reliant in that case on confidential sources. The one, the one thing... Uh, that I would say, you know, when we talk about the like the investigation of Russia, and Margaret talked about how it's, uh, you know, it's it's uh, there, there are people at the post who are sort of working their uh, sources within the intelligence community and within the government. You know, that's important. Certainly, I think that's a, a and at this stage, maybe it is the most important, uh, or, or rather, the most fertile uh, ground, the, the most, you know, where you see the most potential to break news on this Russia stuff. But like. To me, it's always like a higher and better form of journalism if you're actually looking to like go discover that thing yourself. You're not look, you're not like trying to work the FBI to tell to have them tell you what they found. In fact, in my investigation of of this stuff, which I've spent a lot of time uh, doing, I found that the FBI really hasn't done a whole lot. Like I'm, I'm shocked. I talked to people in Ukraine who work with Paul Manafort on behalf of Viktor Yanukovych, the pro-Russian um, strongman who was president of Ukraine until 2014, and these are people who are like so key to this. I mean, they are like they, they are interface between, uh, between you know Manafort and other people in the Trump world and and the Kremlin. And they're like, no, I, the FBI hasn't talked to me. I don't have a lawyer. I don't know what's going. You know, it's like. It's sort of shocking, frankly. So I think it's even more incumbent upon us to do that type of stuff. And circle back, uh, the uh, the uh, anonymous sources are key there as well. Like I talk to people in Ukraine who are like, "Yeah, I'd, I'd love to talk to you, but like uh, my colleague who I work with on this just got blown up in like a car bomb explosion <laughs> because like that that's that's like real. That's the way it happens over there. And and certainly people have concerns here." About, about getting fired or getting prosecuted for leaking classified information, but it's nothing like the former Soviet bloc where so much of the action on this story is taking place and where anonymous sources are vital. Um, so Frontline is a visual form, so we're not writing daily, so it's a very, I, I would say, in our methods, really, we try very hard not to use anonymous sources or confidential sources, but there have certainly been times where we felt like the story had to be told, so we hide people's identities for that reason. We try to be increasingly um, transparent about this, and I would say in general, um, we are going towards an era that I believe that less confidential sources and anonymous sources is ideal, but again, I'm not facing the daily pressure that a lot of the news organizations are facing, and so Frontline occupies a special place. If you could think about a big newspaper and how they publish 20 times a year the biggest stories, that's what we do at Frontline, so we can wait. A lot of times we can wait on whistleblowers to actually give us the goods, the proof, and then we will show the proof. So we're not, in, in many cases, we're not rushing to publish, not that others do, but we just don't have that same pressure. And so I think that's made the work that we do different with confidential sources. And, and um, the other thing is editorially, we have a very small team at Frontline, and the three top people, which is myself and our editor, um, and an amazing libel attorney. The three of us talk extensively about the use of 
anonymous and confidential sources and whether that has led to people distrusting um, journalism increasingly. And, and I just think it's a great question to be asking for all of us. Is there a way to, in some cases, if you're using an anonymous source, how do you back that claim up so somebody is convinced that the person, him or herself, is actually providing factual information to back up their claim. And so we won't use sources unless they have factual backup. That has been painful at times because in fact they've turned out to be right in the end, but we felt editorially at Frontline it was the right thing to do. So in this vein we may be a little bit different, but of course, you know, when you're when you're in a daily situation and that's what you're up against, I would probably make a different decision. So I'm not judgmental at all. So let me ask uh, one last sort of double-barreled question for each of you to answer uh, in, in just a, a minute or less each, and then I'll open it up for uh, audience questions. Um, so, so the question is, is, do we journalists sometimes take for granted that as long as we dig and report the facts, that will convince people of the truth? And, and based on your answer to that question, are you more optimistic or pessimistic about the future of journalism today in this sort of post-truth era? So short, easy question. Uh, <laughs> maybe let's start with Ken and work our way down this way. Um, you know, I think that some of the same phenomena that are uh, challenging to journalism, uh, that is the democratization of information and people sort of becoming their own curator and editor and uh, their access to documents and to live streams of things so that they can get their, you know, information sort of unprocessed. That's, you know, that in many ways is, is, is a problem and it leads to like Pizzagate. Uh, in other ways, it's, it's a positive because it's, you know, it's allowed a thousand flowers to bloom. And I'm, you know, the, yes, there are certainly problems when, it, when you have this new sort of business model or lack of business model ecosystem where, uh, local media in particular is is uh, you know it's it's just difficult to make it work from a from a you know business model perspective from a revenue perspective and that that is you know you would like to think that some of these you know some of the citizen journalists and some of these things that I talked about would sort of rise up in its place I haven't necessarily seen that but I have seen uh, a very sort of robust media environment on some of the like sexier and I, I don't think it's like more important, but higher profile uh, types of coverage, including national political coverage, business coverage, uh, in a way that you you didn't see back in the era of the, the three networks and the you know major metros and the small regional and then local local papers. So uh, I don't know that I've really answered the question, <laughs> but uh, there are definitely things to be uh, optimistic about as well as things to be very concerned about. I mean, the truth is going to matter sometimes, and sometimes it's not. I mean, that's a really mealy mouth answer. But I mean, just in our personal work, one of the stories that I've been working on with a colleague of mine is about um, a lot of abuses at a, a state prison for youth up in northern Wisconsin. Who it's been now under FBI investigation, and I've you know it's mostly minority teenagers up there who, in many cases, have done serious crimes to be put up there. And uh, I never would have dreamed that really anyone in the public would have cared about what's going on there. But uh, you know, we had somebody who was uh, the secretary of the Department of Corrections of Wisconsin, and he's no longer in that role. And and the reason is what was happening there. So I guess you know, it's very difficult to predict sometimes when it's going to matter and when it's not going to matter. But no, I mean, you know, I think you only have to spend time in in, in places like you know, uh, post-Soviet Union republics and, and places like that that don't, ha you know, where the truth doesn't maybe flourish quite as much to know that it, it matters to people and it's not going to stop mattering to people. So <clears throat> I'd say that um, the short answer is that, yes, journalists do often assume that just putting the information out there is enough and that actually, you know, that's sort of a good thing. Uh, they have to kind of take it on faith that doing you know, quality reporting uh, will make a difference, that somebody is reading their articles. I mean, one of the most sort of you know, interesting and consistent things that I notice in all of the conversations I've had with political fact checkers, like the people at uh, the Washington Post 
and at PolitiFact and factcheck.org is that whenever you ask them about you know, whether their work makes a difference, they kind of say, you know, I'm happy to assume, they say really openly, I'm happy to assume that it does, I'm gonna keep doing it no matter what, even if you give me evidence that it doesn't, because I think you know, there's a value in putting it out there. I know that some readers are paying attention. I know that some politicians are paying attention, and that's important. Journalists have to do that, and that you know, applies not only to areas like fact-checking, but also to you know, covering really closely the school board meeting or you know, a local government committee where, where you, you, know, you take it on faith that, uh, that doing this work makes a difference. Sometimes uh, it does, it does very visibly. I would also say, sort of an answer to the, to the second part of the question, that you know, I'm a little uncomfortable with the whole uh, post-fact formulation for a couple of reasons. You know, it sort of suggests that there was a golden age when uh, politicians didn't lie as much, and when people read the paper really closely, and they were you know, scanning for all the facts and making careful decisions. And we know that that's not true. You know, since the very first contested presidential elections in this country, you know, between the founding fathers, you saw wild rumors being hurled back and forth uh, you know, by supporters of, of Jefferson and Adams, for instance. Uh, and at the same time, even though there are a lot of troubling developments, especially, I think, in the willingness of our president and of other political elites to question what had been commonly accepted sources of information, like you know, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, <laughs> numbers, for instance. I think that's troubling. But at the same time, when you look at the journalistic world, despite the sort of you know, unmistakable and undeniable crisis in journalism, this is also actually kind of a golden age for thoughtful, analytical, in-depth, careful, data-driven, evidence-driven reporting. So it really is sort of the best of times uh, and the worst of times. Um, I'm going to pick up on that because I tend to be optimistic. Um, to just say something um, that I think is really important is that increasingly, uh, I agree with Margaret, that you we should, as producers and news organizations, we should be actually publishing as much as we can of the factual information we have, the data sets we have, and to be as transparent as possible. And the good news is, is that now, you know, the dream of transparency, right, of actually being able to all publish this is now extremely easy to do digitally. So for a frontline film, we've just launched this big project. I think it's going to be really exciting called the Transparency Project in which our script will actually be interactive. And we've done it a few times now in which you can, if you're curious enough and you want to know, how do we come to this conclusion? How did we get access to this person? And who are our sources? And, and actually, frankly, we have multiple sources usually for every claim in a film. You can actually go into this interactive script and find it. And so this is something that we've been talking a lot about is, you know, actually publishing narrative and investigative journalism and then backing it up. And you can do it in multiple ways. And I think that's just really important for us to be increasingly proactive in that way, because why not? We have nothing to hide. And, and I really have been encouraging that. Well, we have uh, about 12 or so minutes for some audience questions. So uh, let's get started. Um, where's the microphone? Is it up here? So raise your hand if you have a question. We have one over here, one over here. Let's start with Ron. Well, I'd like to uh, maybe ask Ken, how scared do we need to be about uh, constitutional changes coming? It seems to me that we suddenly we're seeing a story, and it may be true or not, that we're something like six states away from a constitutional convention. And we just had some action in the Wisconsin legislature yesterday. And we know that dark money would like to repeal the New Deal and maybe change the Constitution. So are we scaring ourselves with that story, or is there something we need to pay more attention to? I, I mean, I, I'm pretty confident in the foundation of American government and the, the system of checks and balances. Uh, you talk about re, you know repealing the, the New Deal and the Great Society. Well, there was just an effort to do that in Congress in the form of the uh, American Health Care Act that you saw fail and fail because uh, Frankly, it failed because like Trump is incompetent. But um, so you know, the, if if the if the concern comes you know from the from the top, and you're concerned that Trump is going to the Trump 
uh, team is going to somehow facilitate constitutional changes. They haven't shown much ability to do a whole lot of anything uh, independent of executive action, and even there they've been checked by the courts. So if the concern is from the states up and, and uh, the use by special interests of uh, the um, you know, initiative and referendum process or local and state elections to get their way at the state level, that could potentially become the federal level by virtue of a constitutional convention. That's, I think, a different thing and a more systematic concern that is probably, uh, I don't want to say is well-founded, but is better founded than the concern that Donald Trump is somehow going to uh, you know, seize control of the judiciary like Nicolas Maduro in, uh, in uh, Venezuela. I was thinking more of actually the Koch brothers. Right. So the Koch brothers as well, uh, you know, have had a, a great deal of success in shaping state legislatures and uh, local races in some case, but you don't have to look a whole lot further than Donald Trump to see that their efforts to shape the federal government have mostly been a resounding failure, uh, at least at the highest levels. There are people in the different agencies who are maybe uh, had come through the Koch network and share their beliefs, but as far as the effort to like fundamentally realign American politics around their small government, uh, low taxation, pro-free market philosophy. Again, Trump is the absolute antithesis of that. Yeah, I'd like, uh, if I could, I'd like you to uh, comment on going back to unnamed sources and even whistleblowers. What are your reflections on the potentially different climate or culture um, prevailing culture regarding people's attitudes about coming forward with information and facing pretty severe consequences, potentially. I mean, I found the Trump administration to leak like a sieve. Uh, and it gets back to the, the sort of competence and the experience and the track record in <laughs> government. And there's a lot, there's not a whole lot of it. And so, I mean, I was in the White House yesterday morning meeting with the, like one of the people running the country just trashing everyone else. So, uh, you know, they leak. They leak at the highest levels. They leak at the lowest levels. And uh, they're concerned about it. And that's why they, they do it anonymously. And so we have to weigh. Again, it gets back to the question of weighing when and how to use anonymous sources. But uh, I haven't found the effort to crack down on leakers to be particularly effective. In fact, I'll go back to the Koch brothers. They're like renowned for these very rigorous non-disclosure agreements and like aggressively pursuing people who violate them. That's sort of the myth around it. And I found those agreements to be totally not worth the paper that they're printed on. Hi, I've got a question about the boy who cried wolf in effect. Uh, Trump has been saying a lot about take the the microphone. Uh, We've got a situation in this country where uh, we could very well have emergencies. Uh, uh, if you've checked your, your uh, uh, news feeds this morning, new action from North Korea and all of that, and I'm wondering how would journalists signal that we're supposed to believe the president this time? Will there be some secret way? How will we implement a way for signaling again uh, that we should uh, disregard some of the things that have happened in the past and realize that this is indeed an emergency. And we could feed in almost any leader along those lines, not just Trump, but uh, pick your governor, et cetera. Thank you so much. Well, I think most elected officials do have some concern about their credibility, and they have it for just reasons of self-preservation, and they, they also have it for, because many of them have some interest in governing and being believed by people you know that are, vote for you comes in handy when you're trying to govern you know a city or a state or a nation uh, you know I think it just comes down to again we have to you know we can't we should not take anything that the you know anybody in elected office says at, at face value without checking it out and would it be harder in an emergency situation sure but you know that that's just something that we're going to have to do and i think it's become you know it'll it'll i think it keeps becoming more important not less question over here sure i'll open this up to anybody who has an appropriate response but during the obama administration it was very easy to present a balanced story you'd have the democratic side and the republican side and now when we report on things that trump tweets or says um, even the Republicans don't want to back him up. So we're getting feedback from our viewers that say, we only report negative Trump stories, and it's very ha hard to put 
a, a positive spin on that. So I'm just wondering if anyone had any ideas on how to balance it. I would just say that, I mean, sometimes, you know, reality is not balanced. I mean, one of the big... <laughs> you've seen in, you know, in recent decades an increasing willingness on the part of journalists uh, to move away from he said, she said reporting. Uh, Fact-checking, you know, is, is a clear sign of that. Uh, the difficult reality is that critical, aggressive... Uh, reporting that challenges things that politicians say that doesn't take their claims at face value, that is often unpopular with, you know, half of your audience, right? So it inevitably is going to draw accusations of bias, uh, and it helps to confirm for, for some part of the public uh, the idea that, you know, the mainstream media is, is horribly biased. Uh, but there's no easy way out of that puzzle, and I think all you can do is, you know, report things as fairly uh, and as honestly as you can. But you have to sort of follow the facts where they, wherever they lead. What was that book title? Making friends? How to make friends and influence people? That was like not written by a journalist. Right, right. <laughs> uh, well, one or two last questions. I'd love to have all of you uh, talk a little bit about media literacy. Uh, illiteracy feeds fake news, clearly. <laughs> Um, you were asked about how are we going to signal when there's an emergency. Um, what, what responsibility falls to the reader, the listener, the viewer, and what do you see as your roles in trying to improve media literacy, which is a, a historically low state, I think? Um, I'll say that I get asked more than, I'm just so surprised by this question of how do I get balanced news, and because I agree that balance isn't really the option for us right now, but fairness is that I first ask, well, where are you getting your news? I think it's a great question to ask people, and usually the response I hear now is Facebook. So I say you can get off Facebook, and you can read actual news organizations publishing themselves. You can go to the source of the news. You can go to NPR. You can go to the News Hour. You can go to Politico. You can go to these places to actually find the source, as opposed to assuming that the friend sharing to you is actually news. And I think us educating each other about this is really crucial. And also, PBS has a huge outreach program across the country in high schools. And so I have a middle schooler, and I just feel like it should begin earlier than that even. And so I'm looking at what do we do with middle schoolers and into the early teens, because a lot of your formative ideas about the world and news start to be formed then. So I'm on a tear about this. I think it's really important. I would say the things that we can do to uh, sort of rebut claims of media bias or uh, to, to show mainstream media you know, legacy outlets that are responsible are sort of more valuable in getting it right than uh, maybe fringe outlets or fake news outlets is to get it right and to <laughs> not leave yeah, like even right, a yeah. crack through which they could come to either question your reporting or your credibility. This is not a new phenomenon. In fact, the Clintons I found in de a decade of covering them are among the worst, among the worst or best, depending on how you look at it, this of like finding just that one tiny thing and trying to like not just bring your story down, but bring you down in the most like personal, aggressive and like career threatening ways. Uh, it's, I think in some ways, you know, people like you say like false equivalence on the campaign, like people said like, the Clintons are really bad with the press, but Trump is really bad at the press because he calls you like nasty names and says you're fake news. I feared more the Clintons after mm. years of dealing with them because they would take it to your editor and they would go to your colleagues and say, you can't trust that Vogel story, it's wrong, here are four, and they wouldn't say like why, they just say like, oh, that's wrong, I'm not gonna tell you why, but if you write it, be prepared to like face some of this fury yourself. So uh, this is not necessarily like a new thing, but it's, it's, it makes it even more critical in this age of, of sort of fractured media environment to make sure you're not giving any kind of ammunition for anyone to come at you. Well, with that, we are out of time. Please uh, give a round of applause to our excellent panelists.